Tasa by Nandini Sengupta, a Pondicherry-based journalist, author specializing in historical fiction and narrative history, featured in multiple newspapers. And along with her, we have Sri Abhinav Agarwal, a speaker, author, and a curator of Indica Books, launching the next book here. I request Sri Padmanabhan Govindarajanji and Mrs. Veena Rajaram on stage for the book launch. Namaskar everyone. After Sri Vishnu Shankar Jain's talk, this is going to be a letdown. I have to tell you that. <laughs> There's no way we can uh, you know, match the passion and, and the subject. But we are going to come close. We'll not have an Arnab style debate out here. We need 10 more people on the stage, but we'll try. <laughs> so uh, I have written a book on the Mahabharat. Nandini ji has written a book on Rani Durgavati. I want to ask you, so I'll, I'll, my entire knowledge of Rani Durgavati is from what I read as a child in an Amar Chitra Katha. And thanks to our glorious education system, and I'm admitting this for the first time ever, my sympathies were partly with the great Mughal Emperor Akbar. It was much later that I, when you know, once you escape the Indian education system, your thinking faculties can truly start to blossom. I asked myself some questions. Here is a woman ruler. She marries a tribal king. She becomes the queen. She leads her army into battle. She goes uh, mano a mano against the emperor of India at that time. So if you go by the prevailing Vogue encyclopedia and the checklist, she ticks all the boxes. <laughs> Yet we don't know anything about Rani Durgavati. In fact, one would have thought that after we attained geographical independence, mental decolonization would have happened. We would have learned to embrace our own history, our own stories. That didn't happen. So when Nandini ji's book Rani Durgavati came out, it was uh, such a pleasant surprise. And I've been meaning to ask her some questions about it. Specifically, why was Rani Durgavati's role so diminished in our historical accounts? And when did this start to happen? Because I'm not talking about uh, 100, 200, 300 years back. I'm talking about basically living present memory, which goes back depending on how old you are, it goes back one or two generations, which is 50 to 60 years back. So Nandini ji. Thank you so much, Abhinav. Um, you know, Rani Durgavati's story is a story of memories. The story of why she was forgotten and why she is still remembered. If st that sounds like a conundrum, it is. Because if we look at the primary sources about Rani Durgavati, you will see that her contemporary chroniclers, people who were there when she was alive, remember her with a great deal of grudging respect, if not reverence. People like Abul Fazl, who was the Mughal chronicler, we are talking about 
16th century India, Emperor Akbar the Great, and we'll talk a little bit about that the great bit. Emperor Akbar is in power, and his court hagiographer is Abul Fazl. His job is obviously to write about his emperor, and yet there is a lengthy part <coughs> of Akbar Nama which discusses in detail not only Rani Durgavati's kingdom, but her style of administering the kingdom and what kind of a monarch she was. And even somebody like, you know, uh, later on Ferishta and others who came 10, 12 years afterwards, talk about Rani Durgavati in unabashed purple prose. Remember, these men are not Rani Durgavati's own court hagiographers. They have no real reason to eulogize her. And yet, she gets gr grudging respect from all of them. Cut to 200 years later, and we find another breed of gentlemen talking about Rani Durgavati very, very reverentially. And these are your British civilians. From the late 1700s, that's 18th century onwards, a whole bunch of British civilians are tramping through central India. Rani Durgavati is a central Indian queen. She was queen of a kingdom called Garha Mandala, which is one of the four kingdoms that formed the central Indian tribal area, which used to be known as Gondwana. So Garha Mandala was one of the biggest and most prosperous. This is something that people don't know. One of the biggest and most prosperous Hindu kingdoms in medieval India. So prosperous that they used to mint their own gold coins, which, might I add, many of the strong Rajput kingdoms did not do. They simply used Mughal coinage. But Garha was so prosperous, they had their own gold and silver coins. So when we come to the British civilians, again, people like Frederick Forsyth, people like Alexander Cunningham, people like uh, uh, Schliemann, who talk about Rani Durgavati, talk about her in absolute purple prose. They call her the Indian Buddhika. They liken her to Sita, that blameless symbol of Indian womanhood. And then, suddenly, the stories about her start to die out. When does this happen? This happens, unfortunately, from the 1960s onwards. It's almost as if, in deifying her adversary, Emperor Akbar, we turn her into a footnote in her own story. This is the tragedy of Rani Durgavati. Today, when you go to her kingdom, when you go to Jabalpur and the surrounding districts of Mandla, Dindori, Damo, Narsingpur, you talk to the people there, both tribal Gond and otherwise, every single one of them remember the Rani. Every single one of them remember the songs, remember the stories about her. The tribal Gond were yellow in her memory. I was there in Ju on June 24th, which is a Balidan Divas. Next year is her 500th anniversary. The tribal Gonds love her. It's only now, you know, the Prime Minister has announced that uh, uh, Rani Durgavati will be talked about, will be reclaimed and revered in her 500th anniversary. It has taken us 75 years to give this most underrated monarch what is her due. So it is something that we have done because we gave way too much importance to Akbar the Great. And that's the narrative that I want to take to Abhinav right now. Abhinav, just as you know, we are talking about narratives in this book, in your book as well, there is a question of narrative because a whole section of historians will dismiss uh, Itihasa as being mythology. And yet we have people like Professor B.B. Lal, we have you know, the entire painted greyware pottery era, which has been connected to Mahabharata. Can you tell us a little bit about the historicity of the narrative that you are talking about? How much time do we have? Because this could very well take a few hours. <laughs> I mean, Sri Vyasa writes in the Mahabharat that it took him three years to compose the Mahabharat. Uh, but talking about Itihasa, right, the Mahabharata and the Ramayana are called Itihasa, which loosely translated means history. This is what happened as it happened. Yet we are told this is mythology, myth, mythya. So let us, I'll take two examples. The first one is uh, Sri S.R. Rao. 
he was the director general of the archaeological survey of india and after partition what happened was that a lot of the sites that had been excavated from the indus valley harappan civilization ended up being on the pakistan side of the border including mohenjadaro so there was a need to find sites on the indian side so shri s r rao conducted india's first post independence excavations and one of the first cities that was unearthed was lothal in gujarat so here is a man who has impeccable archaeological credentials in 1985 he got uh, funding to the tune of i think uh, the grand sum of 80000 rupees to conduct what was then india's first marine excavations where off the coast of dwarka why because sri s r rao had read in the mahabharat and then the harivansh that how when the yadavs went from mathura to dwarka they found they did not have enough land so shri krishna prays uh, to varun varun uh, appears and he uh, says and shri krishna asks i want some land and he says i will seed some portion of my waters to you and then he calls vishwakarma and vishwakarma uh, you know extends the city 36 years after the kurukshetra war gandhari's curse takes place and the yadavs end up killing each other at prabhas and the city of dwarka submerges itself this was the myth we were told so shri s r rao did marine excavations over a period of 4 years from 1985 to 1989 they found certain things they photographed those things they found the remnants of a city that had submerged roughly 3 and a half thousand years ago including some toys including door jams including lot of artifacts that basically corroborated what had been written and described in the mahabharat a reasonable conclusion to draw would be that the events described in the mahabharat as they pertained to dwarka were based in fact as with any narrative over a period of 3 3 and a half thousand years or longer you are you are going to end up with some amount of creative artistic uh, descriptions metaphors that will get added to take a simple example someone says he is strong as a bull that is not a literal that is not to be taken literally right you have the use of alankars if a mother says my child has the face of a moon seriously it's not <laughs> it's not to be taken literally yet that is what is used to dismiss the mahabharata as fiction so that is one the second one is that shri bibilal was again he was uh, the director general of the archaeological survey of india and the, and in the 1970s he took early retirement to spend the rest of his time in excavating sites in northern india because at till that point all of the towns and places mentioned in the ramayana and the mahabharat were associated with towns that existed in modern india but there was no connection with whether those towns were really the towns mentioned in those epics so he went about excavating things right from kurukshetra which by the way is the site of the great war and uh, kurukshetra has got a history that goes further back than the kurukshetra war so meerut and uh, kanpur and uh, kurukshetra he did his excavations and also at indraprastha i mean basically the old fort area and he found artifacts that were consistent which are called the painted grave air uh, artifacts which are consistent with a period going back 3 and a half thousand years ago roughly 3 and a half thousand years ago which is also what shri s r rao had dated that the kurukshetra war took place roughly 1500 1600 bce now there is no consensus of when exactly that war took place but one general date that a lot of scholars agree upon is 1500 to 16 1700 is when that war took place so any reasonable conclusion would be that the events described in the mahabharat are based on fact with artistic embellishments added over the last thousands of years so that is one narrative the second narrative that is really interesting is that the narrative of women in the mahabharat how many of you have heard of this phrase being used in a slightly pejorative sense are badi sati savitri hai you know very pious devoted woman is in modern times it is dismissed with this phrase sati savitri we all know the basic story of savitri right savitri satyavan 
here is a woman. So we know the part where she goes and has this uh, talk and walk with the yam. But before that, Savitri was a very beautiful woman. She grew up uh, as a very beautiful princess. Mahabharata tells us she was so beautiful that no prince of the land could muster up the courage to go and ask her father for her hand in marriage. So what does the father do? He says, go find a groom for yourself and whoever you find, I will marry you to him. She goes out with a retinue and she comes back at a point where her father Ashwapati is in discussions with the sage Narad and she says, I have found the man I want to marry and his name is Satyavan and Narad says, mm, not a good choice. And Ashwapati is like, you know, why? Is he not handsome? Is he not truthful? Is he not generous? Is he not brave? Is, and he says, no, 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 he is brave and generous like Shibi and, and everything. He has just got one fault. He is destined to die one year from now. Ashwapati says, no, my daughter, please, you can't marry him. Satyavati says, no, I have selected him as my groom. I am going to marry him. Ashwapati agrees to his daughter and marries the two. Is this consistent with the picture of society that we have been told where women had no agency, they had no freedom, they had no independence, they were mere chattel? I don't think so. And then she doesn't uh, stay as a, as a helpless uh, woman for that one year. When that one year period goes, uh, is over, she accompanies Satyavan to the forest Inevitable happens, Satyavan falls down dead. Not Yamdud, but Yamraj comes, takes his soul and starts to walk and she walks with him. Now, here is a person who is literally walking with the god of death. How many, pe how many of us would be able to summon up that courage? Yet she walks with him. He gives her boon after boon. Every boon that he gives her, Five boons, four boons, he tells her, you can ask for anything except your husband's life back. Fifth time when he gives her a boon, he says, no conditions, and she literally gets her husband's life back from the God of death. I don't know if that is not the definition of a strong woman, then who is? Shakuntala, the Shakuntala of Kalidasa is very different from the Shakuntala of Vyasa. So not only does she agree when uh, uh, so when in Sage Kanva's ashram, Dushyant comes, Shakuntala tells him her life story. She doesn't shy away that, no, I am Kanva's uh, daughter, but I am not from him. I am from uh, Menka and Vishwamitra. And when he says, I, I want to marry you, she agrees. She doesn't say that, no, 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 I'll have to wait for my father. So there is also an example of a woman exhibiting, exercising her right. How can you be a liar like that? And then he says, I don't know you. Any woman can come and say that, uh, you know, they are uh, my wife and all. Shakuntala turns and gives it back to Dushyant saying, if we want to compare births, who knows about your birth? I am the daughter of Vishwamitra and Menka. Comparing the two of us is like comparing a mountain with a bilva seed. If that is not a woman of agency, courage, independence, I don't know what is. And yet we have been told that bechari, bebas, lachar, asahai, and we have been taught to believe that. So one of the purposes in writing this book was basically twofold. The first one was stick with the Vyasa Mahabharata. If anyone has one of the areas where a lot of people have questions or they fly into a rage is if someone says that Karan was a coward. They don't like to hear that. So I've said, okay, here is where Karan runs away from battle. Once and twice he runs away from battle and here are the references. You can consult the Vyasa Mahabharat. Other was that wherever you have doubts or I think uh, some clarifications would be needed, I've put in a reference to the Vyasa Mahabharat. You can go and consult the chapter and verse, but write it in a style that the modern reader would like to read. So that was my effort at, uh, at uh, fighting narratives. 
So um, thank you, Abhinav. That was that was really interesting. In fact, I would like to liken uh, Rani Durgavati a little bit with some of this amazing women from the Mahabharat. Um, one of the reasons why I have been so obsessed with Rani Durgavati is because she appeared to me to be the most modern medieval monarch I have ever come across. Uh, she marries. Um, she's she's a Chandel princess. She is from impeccable Rajput lineage. She marries a tribal Gond prince against her father's wishes. Runs away, marries him, is blissfully happy. He dies. There is pressure on her to commit sati. She fobs off a, a brother-in-law who's waiting in the wings. Uh, her, her son is just about three or five years old, depending on which account you take. Uh, he's too small to become king. She wants to be regent. Uh, her brother-in-law has the same idea, but she gets to talk to everybody in her husband's court and plays the game of real politics so effectively that the brother-in-law is forced to leave the kingdom and as long as she's alive, he never sets foot in Garha again. She becomes the region and she rules the kingdom wisely and well, so well in fact, that her people 500 years later still call her not only the model monarch but a goddess. But coming back a little bit to the narrative, I just want to compare what uh, the lay person would know about this uh, very, very underrated medieval monarch. If you go to Wikipedia, and I, I entreat you never to go to Wikipedia if you're doing your research, but if you do, you know, you'll find that she's described in like two, three lines. She's a tribal Gond queen who was defeated in battle by Akbar's general Asaf Khan. Okay, there the matter ends. What they don't tell us is that in her 15 years as queen regent, Rani Durgavati faced more than 50 battles and remained unvanquished in all but the last battle. And even in the last battle, which was spread over two days, the first day she was victorious. The second, she was not because her generals didn't listen to her tactical advice on warfare. They would have won if her generals listened to what she was suggesting. They didn't, and that's the reason why they lost. Remember, the tribal Gond army was no comparison to the Imperial Mughals. The Imperial Mughal army was much better trained. They had horses, they had cannons, which the Gonds did not. They just used terrain, and they used terrain so smartly and so effectively that the first day the Mughals were defeated. How do we know this? Again, I go back to primary sources. Abul Fazl himself says that at the end of the first day, more than 300 Mughal soldiers were martyred. This is his words. And remember, he will try to embellish it for his emperor. He's not going to want to make his emperor mad at him. He says this. The second day, they lose the battle because her generals don't listen to her. But what are we told? When we talk about Rani Durgavati, she is a footnote in the larger story of Emperor Akbar. And you know, Emperor Akbar is one of the greats. We have Indian histories full of the greats, you know, Ashoka the Great, Akbar the Great. They are all the greats and they are all male. Uh, it's almost as if the women in, in Indian history did not exist. Um, the truth is that Akbar was undoubtedly a very unusual medieval monarch. But, here's the rub, he wasn't the only unusual medieval monarch. And if we look at Akbar's story, and I want to just read out a very short two, three lines from my book, which will tell you why I'm saying this. We tend to think of Akbar as this tolerant, very wise monarch, right? Which he was. But he became tolerant and wise 25 years after he became king. The early Akbar was neither very tolerant nor anywhere near the, you know, benign monarch that Bollywood has popularized. He was nothing like that. He was very insecure. He was, by his own admission, a very staunch Muslim. And if you look at what he says, the reason for his ex expanding, expansionist policies, they are definitively based in jihad. I'm going to read out a short passage from the fatnama e chitor The fatnama e chitor is an imperial farman 
uh, announced after the siege of Chitor, which is the most brutal campaign Akbar has ever taken part in. Some 30,000 people were killed, out of them 27,000 were peasants. Okay? This is what Akbar says about why he attacks the Sisodias. This is dated 9th of March, 1568. This is just after he wins the siege of Chitor. We spend our precious time to the best of our ability in war or Gaza and Jihad and with the help of eternal God who is the supporter of our ever increasing empire we are busy in subjugating localities, habitations, forts and towns which are under the possession of the infidels may God forsake and annihilate all of them and thus raising the standard of Islam everywhere and removing the darkness of polytheism and violent sins by the use of the sword. We destroy the places of worship of idols in those places and other parts of India." Unquote. This is Akbar's own words. This is him talking about why he is attacking Chitor. Remember that when Akbar first came to power, he was under the control of noblemen like Bairam Khan. After the fall of Bairam Khan, he came, he was flip-flopping between appeasing the Sunni radicals in his court and trying to keep the Rajputs in his corner. After the siege of Chitor, there was no real need to give any carrots to the Rajputs because all the Rajput clans fell in line. So we see where something very interesting happening. We see in 1564, he abolishes jizya. In 1564, he also gives 200 bigas of free land to the Madan Mohan temple in Vrindavan. And then he goes and attacks Rani Durgavati, one of the last remaining big Hindu kingdoms in India. Same year. So he keeps flip-flopping. And then when Sheikh Abdul Nabi comes into the picture, latter part of the 1560s, the jizya comes back. And it is abolished only when Sheikh Abdul Nabi makes a an exit towards the end of the 1570s. So Akbar's tolerance has to be seen in perspective. Let us look at Rani Durgavati. When we say that Akbar was tolerant and that he was okay with having people f from Hindu uh, clans, Rajputs, in his, in his army, what did Rani Durgavati do? Before the battle of Narayanala, one of the big battles she faced was with the Miana Afghans. She destroyed them in that battle. They were completely, thoroughly defeated. And they were so impressed with her battle strategies, they joined her army. Every single one of those generals, you know, I have the names, Shams Khan Miana, Mubarak Khan, Mia Bukhari Rumi, Khan Jahan Daki, there are a whole lot of these Miana Afghan generals who were her top generals. Every single one of them fought for her and lost their lives in the final battle of Narayanala. They would not have done it if they did not respect her, both as a leader and as a monarch. If that is not tolerance, I don't know what is. I have one question. So here is, by primary historical accounts, a woman monarch who is exemplary and, and brave and resourceful and can command the respect why is she not a role model, a feminine role model? Why indeed? So, so Rani Durgavati is interesting also because I, I like to think of myself as a feminist. And my idol is Rani Durgavati. Because if you look at her, she, she sort of, she is a very strong woman, she is a monarch, she is running her kingdom, she is efficient, she is kind, she is benevolent, she is also a warrior, she is protecting her people, she is a perfect mother, she is a perfect wife, all of that. But a large part of her hagiography also talks about her sacred duties. If we look at some of the books that were written during her time, <coughs> both secular as well as religious literature, they talk about the number of temples that she consecrates, the number of months that she consecrates. And she's, you know, she's constantly connected to including the Chausad Yogini temple in Jabalpur, which is connected to her memory, the Pachmatha temple in Jabalpur, which is connected to her memory, the Bajnamat temple in Jabalpur, which is connected to her memory. All of these temples 
were very much a part of her sacred duties. Alongside her secular duty, she is also known as the Tal Talao Rani. She went and you know rejuvenated and dug so many lakes in the Jabalpur area that Bhavan Lake Chausat Talao. So she became known as the Tal Talao Rani, person who was she was a lady of the lakes. So secular public works, sacred works, both sides were equally balanced in her. She is not somebody who tries very hard to be a man. If you look at Rani Durgavati's contemporary pictures, this is her in her non-warrior role. You can see she's very feminine, she was known for her beauty, etc. But there is another picture of her, which I couldn't get unfortunately because it was so expensive, in the Akbar Nama, where she's wearing the poshak, she's wearing chain mail, she has the naked sword in her hand. She is completely and utterly a warrior, a medieval warrior. So the two sides, this, this feminism and femininity, are perfectly balanced in her. And that, I think, is not maybe woke enough for her to become an icon. So I'm probably putting words in your mouth, but you're saying according to the Western definition of feminism, a woman has to lose her femininity to become a feminine icon. Yeah, well, you know, we are constantly being told you shouldn't wear pink, you should not be so feminine, you, should, you know, you shouldn't be a girly girl. It's not. And again, I would go back to the women in the Mahabharata. Why don't you talk a little bit about how they exemplify the Bharatiya version of feminism as opposed to, you know, the one that we import lock stock and two smoking barrels. How many, you know the story of... Uh uh, Kach and Devayani, right? And after Kach leaves uh, for back for the heavens, having taken the secret of uh, Sanjeevani from uh, Shukracharya, Devayani is heartbroken and all. And then comes Yayati. Okay. Around the same time, what happens is that uh, Devayani and Sharmishtha get into a fight. Devyani is, by the way, Shukracharya's daughter. Sharmishtha is Vrishparv's daughter, who is the king of the Asuls. They get into a fight, and Sharmishtha pushes Devyani into a well. And Yayati comes along, and he sees uh, uh, you know, this lady fallen in a well, and he pulls her out, and he leaves. Now, according to some very popular storytellers, what happens is that because Yayati had touched Devyani's hand, she had to marry him. I won't name that person. Uh, that would be to, to, to lower the dignity of this stage and to dignify that person. But this is how we are told. What does the story tell us, right? So, Devyani is pulled out and she refuses to go back to her father's place. And uh, Shukracharya comes running and he says, what happened, my dear daughter? And th she says, this is what happened and I'm not going back. Shukracharya says that uh, I am also leaving this kingdom where my daughter is not going to be respected. And Vishparv comes and he begs forgiveness and Devyani says, not you. The deed was not yours, it was your daughter's. She has to apologize and she has to become my servant. And she will come with me, go wherever I go. And she agrees. Sharmishta says, I'm not going to jeopardize my father's kingdom for my mistake. So far, so good. Yayati again comes along and Devyani says, fine, I want to marry you. Yayati says, uh, not without your father's permission, I'm not going to incur a sage's wrath by you know, marrying without uh, his permission and Shukracharya gives her the permission. So first of all, here's another narrative. Devyani wasn't forced into marriage because uh, Yayati touched her hand while pulling her out of the well. Why? There is so much of, I think, drama, so much of agency already in the women in the Mahabharata. Why do we have to create fake narratives? So anyway, my coming uh, uh, back to the story. So the two are married, Devyani and uh, uh, Yayati, and the Sharmishta goes along with them. And here's where the delicious part comes in, uh, befitting, I think, the best of uh, the Sas Bahu serials. Shukracharya calls uh, Yayati by the side and he says, uh, I'm your do my daughter is married to you. He says, uh, Ji Gurudev. And he says, uh, Sharmishtha will also accompany 
her he says ji gurudev and he says don't call her to your room shukracharya knows how men are but here is what happens uh devyani has a child eventually sharmishta for whom yayati builds a nice palace outside the main palace in the gardens she starts to think okay you know i also need to marry and have children where will i find a husband let's shorten the search and she says a friend's husband is like one's own husband <laughs> literally her own words and she how to say this she basically seduces yayati okay and uh, she says that uh, no, when yayati tells her that i can't lie she tells him it is perfectly okay to lie under five con- uh, situations one of them is uh, when your riches are about to be lost when your life is about to be lost and one of the five reasons also given is when at the time of marriage uttering a lie is totally acceptable <laughs> the two are married and they have kids devyani has two kids sharmishta ends up having three kids which is an inversion of the situation that happens with pandu and kunti and madri now here are two strong women when devyani finds out she is again heartbroken and she confronts oh by the way yayati doesn't confess that these are my children so what happens is that one day devyani and yayati go out into the garden and there are sharmishtha's kids and they come running papa papa <laughs> yayati is tongue tied she figures out what's happened devyani and sharmishtha confront each other and uh, this is the part that i love about the mahabharat when devyani asks how dare you sharmishtha replies in a in a way with a very straight face matter of factly uh, tone you selected yayati as your husband so did i <laughs> and anyway to conclude the story what happens is that shukracharya curses yayati that you will lose your youth for you know because of which you have become such a you know characterless man <laughs> and he then says but i have still not had my fill of youth dil mange more so shukracharya says fine if you can find someone who will exchange his youth for your decrepit old age so you know you can do that and he goes to all of his five sons one by one all of them refuse except the last one puru who agrees yayati curses as all his four sons including yadu that your children will never become king which is why krishna was a yadav descended from yadu but never became the king the youngest one puru becomes the king so the la- actually i'll say one more which is ego ego plays a big role in the mahabharat the bravest biggest warrior in the mahabharat is probably bhishma who gets into a fight with parshuram over a woman that neither is interested in by the way <laughs> the say, bhishma tells parshuram when parshuram says that uh, you know fine i will fight you i will kill you bhishma is a young warrior at that point he tells uh, parshuram whoever kshatriyas uh, that you defeated and killed they were there when i was not there okay and the two fight for i think 23 days and parshuram cannot defeat bhishma Amba then goes and uh, does penance in the forest and she gets a boon from Mahadev that you will become the cause for Bhishma's death now here is the irony a warrior who no one could defeat who had a boon that he can choose his uh, the point and the time of his death ends up on the 10th day of the Kurukshetra war falling to in today's terminology that would essentially be a transgender warrior shikhandi so look at how egos are humbled in the mahabharat each and every one's ego is humbled arjun's gandiv refuses to he cannot even string the gandiv 36 years after the kurukshetra war when he is escorting the women of the Maha, of of the yadav uh, dynasty who are, who are still left and the thieves robbers come and start to take the women away he cannot even string the gandiv it comes it falls to vyasa to tell him your time is up recognize that so my whole point was that there is so much of 
captivating stories and lessons in the Mahabharat, I for the life of me cannot understand why writers have to distort the epic. It, it, is it some sort of an expression of woke frustration? Is it a reflection of their own inadequacies as writers that they have to distort epics? There's one, another popular writer who writes, uh, the Mahabharata that we have been taught is not what Vyasa's Mahabharata is. And I'm wondering if Konsi Vyasa Mahabharata that he has read that the entire world has not. Because Vyasa, here's the thing, of the 100,000 shlokas in the Mahabharata that we are told are traditionally ascribed to the Mahabharata, Vyasa never says which are his and which are later editions. All he says is that 24,000 shlokas were written by Vyasa. And then over a period of time, more stories were added to it, which increased the count to 100,000 shlokas. Vyasa has not said ki like, ye mere hai, and these are you know, other shlokas. Yet, scholars come up every few years that you know, I will apply machine learning, statistical techniques, and I will tell you who wrote which one. Last point is that here is the beauty of, uh, of the so-called scholarship, German Indologists said that we will tell you what uh, the Gita is a later interpolation. Furthermore, we will tell you what are the original shlokas of the Gita and which were added by later Vaishnav uh, devotees. Six or seven of them came up with their own numbers. One said, only one shloka in the Gita is original. <laughs> Another said, 300 are original. Another said, 55 are original. These are the scholars we are supposed to look up to, to who will come and tell us what our epics were. So, you have the Vyasa Mahabharat. Bhandarkar Oriental Research Institute came up with a critical edition in 1966. Read that, read the original if you can, in Sanskrit or in an Indic language or an English translation. So, you know, it's interesting you're talking about how the narrative gets skewed. And um, here I would sort of like to uh, bring a comparison uh, with another historical figure uh, who was Rani Durgavati's contemporary. Um, and I'd like to sort of just quickly tell this story just to show how much the narrative gets skewed. So Rani Durgavati's kingdom in Garha, Garha Mandala or Garha Katanga, was surrounded by uh, a bunch of neighbors who were nothing short of baying jackals. One of them, the most bloodthirsty one, was a gentleman called Baz Bahadur. Paz Bahadur was the ruler of Malwa and today if you go to Mandu, you will see this very beautiful palace that he built for his paramour, for his girlfriend slash queen, Rupmati. So the legend of the love of Baz Bahadur and Rupmati is very, very well entrenched and the entire song and light show in Mandu is all about this story. Okay, so this is the narrative. Baz Bahadur was a lover, he loved music, he fell in love with Rupmati. Rupmati wanted to see river uh, Narmada and so he built this palace for her next to the river. And that makes Baz Bahadur out to be some kind of a Bollywood, you know, Ashik. Let's see what history actually says. So it's true that Baz Bahadur fell in love with Rupmati, we don't really know whether Rupmati fell in love with him, which is <laughs> in direct contrast to what happened with Durgavati and her husband Dalpati. They definitely fell in love with each other. In this case, the king falls in love with this girl who is very beautiful, sings like a nightingale, brings her over, builds her this golden cage, you know, the palace in Mandu. And then what happens? So Akbar's milk brother, Adham Khan, uh, decides that Malwa is way too rich to be ignored by the Mughal army. And also he finds out about Rupmati, how beautiful Rupmati is. So he says, oh, achai, you know, <laughs> this, is, this is a good way to get my hands on both Malwa's legendary wealth and the beautiful Rupmati. So Adham Khan attacks Malwa, Baz Bahadur, who just before that had been definitively defeated by Rani Durgavati and was so sad and so ashamed that he immersed himself in wine and song, quote unquote Ferishta, very Bollywood of him. Uh, uh, he now gets defeated again. Clearly he was no soldier. 
So he is once again defeated by Adam Khan's army. What does he do to his beloved? He abandons her and runs away. Okay? Bas Bahadur. Yeah. Bas Bahadur. He abandons his wife slash beloved and runs away. What happens to Rupmati then? Adham Khan enters the seraglio. Rupmati consumes poison and dies. Okay? What does Bas Bahadur do now? Interesting man, is he not? He lands up at the doorstep of Rana Uday Singh, the Sisodias, in Chitor, bringing Akbar's attention on to Chitor. Okay? Of course, Akbar had been planning to take on the Sisodias for a while. This was one more tick in the box. After the fall of Chitor, Bas Bahadur resurfaces again, this time as a courtier in Akbar's court, where he is very well known for a new kind of music which is known as Baz Khani. Very interesting man, I have to say. So he, he runs away from his own kingdom, abandons his wife and you know, beloved, goes to the Sisodia, brings the marauding Mughal army to their doorstep, runs away again and finally turns up at Akbar's court as a musician par excellence. And yet, how do we remember him? As the perfect lover, you know, and Ashik and his mashuk is Rupmati. This is how the narrative gets skewed. And this is the story that, you know, we are being fed. When the reality really is that Baz Bahadur was a feckless character who was no good at the battlefield and therefore lost his kingdom and his wife. And we have no business eulogizing him. No. No. No, it's it, light and sound show is about the love story. But the love story is, that's what I'm trying to say, that the love story is a bit of, um, you know, exaggeration. It's, it's, it's a bit of, it, it's fiction, basically. We don't even know if Rupmati was in love with him. So just to add on to you, Nandini ji, I was there in the Mandu court only a month back. Surprisingly, the ASI guides, ASI certified guides, are exactly speaking the same story that... Yeah, because this story has been recorded by people like Ferishta. There is a primary reference to it. And if you look at the contemporary sources, you know, people like um, uh, um, Abul Fazl and Ferishta and other people who are writing at that time, Baz Bahadur comes out really badly. He is seen as feckless, he is seen as useless, a man who is given to wine and song and not fit to rule. That's the kind of picture that you get of him. And then five, hundred, five centuries later, he goes through this kind of, you know, spin doctoring <laughs> makeover and becomes this lover boy whom we are all eulogizing. This is how the narrative changes. On a slightly flippant note, I think Baz Bahadur looks to be the exemplar of a lot of modern day politicians, if I may add. <laughs> <laughs> but I think that's a very interesting point you made, which is that when you have fake narratives and mythology being built, it serves two things. First of all, the obvious one is that we are being taught wrong or false history. The second, and I think the more insidious damage that it does is that it reduces the space and the public attention from actual facts because we as humans have a finite capacity to pay attention. And if 90% of the things being presented to us are of a certain narrative, we are, by human nature, we are not going to look at the 10%. In other words, we are not going to look at what is, we look what we are being shown. Rarely do we ask ourselves to question, what is it we are not being told? Okay, so I, we've just been informed that our time is up. If there are any questions, uh, we would love to take them. Yeah, please go ahead. Like, you know, kind of sideline women, and how do we, as the OG 
Mukherjee Indic feminists deal with that also to ensure that the young minds don't, they don't see one example of this guy quoting uh, or misquoting some scripture and then say, yeah, yeah, this, this uh, fits the paradigm with which what my leftist friend told me. So what is our role and responsibility in busting this myth? See, I think we should always look at history. And, uh, and I, I, I uh, would like to think that there is this great churn happening. There is a whole new uh, narrative of history that is coming up. If you look at, the, look at our history, look at the kind of women that our history has had. I mean, Rani Durgavati is one, but there are so many others. There's Rani Ahalya Bai, there's Rudrama Devi, there's Abakka Chauta. There are so many, there's Prabhavati Gupta, there is Didda. There are hundreds and hundreds of amazing queens. And their agency, their strength tells you that we could not have had a regressive patriarchal setup if these women were, were doing so well. We could not have. You know, the truth is if you look at medieval Europe, before Tudor England sees Elizabeth coming in, you see the number of sassy queens they had. You look at us, you, that tells you the story. If you really have a regressive uh, social structure, you wouldn't have these women doing so well. No, I mean, <coughs> I think you raised a very important point, which is that the context matters. You cannot pick out lines from the epics, from the texts in isolation. You have to look at the context, which is what any academic will also say. But unfortunately, when it comes to the other side, it becomes fashionable to take one line out of context and present it as being representative of an entire faith. Okay, I'm violating my own rule of no only questions, no observations. But this is very important. Talking about light and sound show, there is a light and sound show in Orcha, which tells you the story of the temple. But there is one, this absolutely fake story of one of Aurangzeb's daughters dressing up as a man and riding to Orcha to save the Ram temple from her father's wrath. And this is told in the light and sound show. Okay, Aurangzeb's daughter. Yeah, and I searched high and low for references and I found a lot of material on the internet, but it all says, legend says, Kaunsi legend bhai? Source kya hai? What is the contemporary source? No one says that. Somebody nonsense. came this. Yeah, this it's nonsense. absolute nonsense. Yeah. This is very... You, so but you know, ji, I want to say something here. It's very interesting you're talking about Aurangzeb's daughter because when I was uh, researching for Rani Durgavati, I was also looking at a lot at uh, folk tales and uh, folk traditions of the region. And there is a very well-known secular Hindi book written in the 16th century called Chimni Charitam. In Chimni Charitam, Chimni is a Mughal princess slash Aurangzeb's daughter and she falls in love with a Gond prince, Hirdesha, who is a later, actual later Gond ruler. She falls in love with him, they run away, Aurangzeb comes and attacks him, then there is this ding dong battle that happens and finally Chimni goes and tells her father that please let my husband go or whatever and he finally uh, you know, pardons them and goes back. So there is a tradition, Orcha is very close to, uh, not very far from Jabalpur. I think that region has a kind of fictional tradition involving a Mughal princess's love for a character, you know, for a local Raja. Okay, no, uh, again, I just want to say something since we are talking about it. The fault lies in us, is that these uh, light and sound shows are given to people and usually yeah. Bollywood people. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. they don't have it because I know I've uh, given a voiceover for lots and Paresh has done the Somnath voiceover. Yeah. So that's what happens. Yeah. And that's where we have to take a step and say, no, this is wrong. Yeah. True, true. as a garrison to keep control on the entire Malwa belt. And it used to have some 8,000 horsemen 
And even today, there was a natural ha water harvesting system which exists there, which is capable of holding 80,000 liters of water. And this history is completely whitewashed. Nowhere in the book. I purchased a book from the ASI outlet in the Mandu port, and even that book doesn't speak of it, whereas the structure is still existing over there. Yeah, that's, that's what I mean by narrative being, you know, hijacked and turned into something else. Thank you very much. A big thank you to Western Ghats. This has been a wonderful experience. Thank you so much. Thank you, Shipan. Thank you, Western Ghats, uh, for this invitation and thank you for being such a lovely audience. Thank you, ma'am and sir, for the enlightening and informative session. I call upon Srimati Omashri and Lalita Ramaswamy to come up to the stage to felicitate. Srimati Palani, Kavita Palani Sami to come up to the stage to felicitate.